Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast. Each week, your host, Casey Haston, Director of Recruiting at VIP, will bring you valuable insights from thought leaders, introduce you to incredible companies, and bring you tips for landing your dream job from our team of executive recruiters at VIP. And now, Casey Haston. Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast, a podcast devoted to adding value to your career or candidate search, brought to you by VIP. I'm your host, Casey Haston, executive recruiter, director of recruiting with VIP, and your all-around hiring guru. And to be honest with you, I'm surprised that I am sitting still right now because number one, I have the most amazing guest in the studio with me today, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. Um, but we also are recording with our first live audience, and we're going to give them a chance to ask our guests some questions towards the end. And this is going to be a two-part episode of the VIP uh, podcast. So let me introduce my guest today. I'm so excited. So today we have Amelia Antonetti, one of the most sought-after human behavior and strategic advisor experts in the world. She is endorsed, get ready, by Oprah, Zig Ziglar was her personal mentor, oh my God, and Steve, Steve Harvey also endorses her and you currently work for Steve Harvey. Her genius key philosophy involves a matrix and people translation for purpose, performance, and meaning, aligning people and workflow together. She is committed to providing leaders the ability to understand and amplify their people so all companies can have what they need to better serve the company's business purpose, customers, and communities. They all serve unitedly for a greater impact for all. I, okay, first of all, I am so excited you're here today. I'm, I'm excited. About this for I'm weeks. excited. Yes. Well, let me tell you, I am so, and I always want to give a shout out to the person that connected us. And I had met Adam Connors through a series of connections. And I was going, he goes, go through my podcast and let me know if there's anybody you want me to introduce you to. And I got to you and I was like, will she? <laughs> Is it possible? And, but you have to ask, right? My mentor always says, get your ass in gear, yeah, right? Yeah. And so I sent him an email with three names and he said, okay, two of them said yes. I was like, please tell me one of them was Amelia. <laughs> he was like, yes. <laughs> I love Adam. Yeah. Adam and I go way back and he is one of my favorite people. Absolutely hands down a favorite people. Yeah. Just, he's the keeper. Yeah. yeah. I won't tell you what he said the first time I got on the phone with him. <laughs> <laughs> and I had him on speaker. <laughs> but I believe you. I, I totally believe you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, a, yeah. he's a character. So I want to kind of set up the, the foundation of your expertise, okay? Okay. And the first thing I'd like to talk about today is, you know, just kind of discussing one of the traits that makes you so successful, your desire to always be learning and seek those opportunities. So one of those traits led you to creating the Listerine strip. I know, right? So how many of y'all use those? So tell us how that happened. That's weird. So I really believe in you are where you're supposed to be, even if at the moment you're like, "What am I doing here?" So I was asked to come. Um, I was doing a speaking gig in Asia. Um, so here I am, getting ready. You know, I'm flying over. I'm looking at the stuff, and I'm like, "Medical conference." And I was like, "What? <laughs> Why would I be speaking at a medical conference?" I was like. All right, you know, and so I, you know, I'm getting ever, I get into the conference, um, you know, you get into the green room early, there's wall to wall men. I was like, okay, I'm clearly outnumbered. And they're all doctors, doctors, scientists, researchers. And I was like, clearly, I do not believe, belong here. And so at that point, you know, you have two choices. I was like, okay, I can go and gallivant around, explore the city, or I can stay here and figure out why am I here? Like, what is it that the universe knows that I clearly have no idea what I'm here? So I was like, it's like, okay, bam. And so I went into this workshop, and I'm sitting in this workshop, and there's a guy up front, big honking scientists, researchers, bunch of words I had never heard in my entire life. And what he was talking about was that they had the patent on a new medical delivery system for elderly people because they can't swallow, and this new medical device melted on their tongue to deliver medicine. And my brain went, oh, I want that in OTC, over the counter. And so I waited. I went up afterwards. I'm like, hey, I said, what would it cost for the license for the United States for this? He's like, ma'am, this is a very sophisticated medical delivery system. I don't think you understand. This is not a mass consumer good. And I said, 
thank you so much for that. So what I asked was, how much is the license <laughs> for North America for that very sophisticated meta that I want to put breath freshener on because I think it would scale? And he was like, okay, I'll give you like my boss type of thing. And so I quickly picked up my phone and talked to my lawyer and I'm like, hey, I need to borrow some money because I want to purchase the rights to this technology. And my lawyer was like, you want to put breath freshener on it and you're like you are that crazy right <laughs> but that's kind of like the thing like why are you here what's your genius what do you uncover so we brought it stateside and went to dr fresh and from dr fresh it went to listerine so it was not my invention i just saw it and i was like i think there's a way to make this solve a problem but I think that's what makes you so genius is that you look at something that everybody else will say, okay, that's the only path you can take with that. And then you're like, no, 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 no. Let's, let's think around this corner here and see what else we can do with it. So I think that is yeah. absolutely amazing. And so tell me a little bit about how, how did you learn to do what you do to serve businesses? Well, I, so, you know, your, the thing that I love about the word genius is that it's innate. Right? Genius is not something that you can buy. It's not something you can go to school and write. It's your innate genius. And because I was an odd duck, like, since I got here, like, I never <laughs> was a kid in preschool. They were like, yeah, that one's going to be in special ed. You know, I, like, I never kind of blended. And so I had to kind of figure out, well, why am I wired differently? Why does that matter? And I'm here for a reason. So how does that skill apply? And so through just survival, right, of your early years, I realized that I could very quickly heal pain, solve problems, bring joy where there's sadness by applying how I saw something. My perspective on everything is never the norm. So something as simple as if I said, okay, look at the sky, what do you see? What you see and what I see are light years different. And what I realized was that everybody has the skill. Everybody has this incredible perspective. And so I really seek to understand each individual on what they see, hear, and feel. And it's been my, my obsession. And that is how I've been be able to unravel business. Business has already been proven that this, the secret to success for business is people, right? It's not the product. It's not the technology. It's the people. And so I said, well, I want to become a people expert. And so I'm not a business expert. I'm a people expert. I think I heard you mention one time about all the different credentials that you have oh, because you're like on like this. I, I think I'm a consummate student, but man. Well, I just, you know, I'm, I'm obsessive compulsive, right? So once I get onto something, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so fascinating. And that leads you to something else. And, you know, I think part of sustainable success is being curious. Mm. And so I'm extremely curious about everything. And so I'm an overgrown puppy with big feet. Like, I'm always looking like, wow, this is so great. Look at this. I stumbled. I fell. I got up. Like, oh my God. like I'm always like that, that kind of character, right? And so I just go with it instead of trying to change it. I love that. I love that. I think I'm going to start maybe taking that approach, the puppy approach. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm like, I got big feet. I'm sorry. You know, so I'm going to fall around a lot, you know? So yeah, that, that's just my way. Yeah, I love that. So your work helps companies identify why they exist and they measure it against how they present themselves to the world. What is the first step you take with companies to help them align their purpose and with how they are perceived? So I'm a big fan um, of understanding why. Like, I am just that girl. If you ask me to do something, I'm going to just want to know why. And so I'm um, also a huge fan of Simon Sinek, right? The why, like big fan. I'm listening to the and infinite so, game right, right now. <laughs> so when he came out, I was like, man, I've been saying that for years, but he's got a great way of simplifying how much knowing why impacts everything else. And I'm a big believer. I'm paddling in that same direction. Um, and I'm just a continual student on how your why changes based on different uh, variables. And I focus on it specifically in the people operating system of anything. Even if you're a family, it's a people operating system. Right. If you're a team, it's a people operating system. Every comes down to a people operating system. The old way of thinking, right, that stockholder focus down is focused so much on um, 
systems, processes, mm -hmm. procedures, check and balance, da 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 da, as if that was the secret to success. And it's not. Because none of those things capture the heart of people. So you take a look at it from a sports analogy. Why is it that that team wins, but it's the underdog, right? It's that combination of people in that specific period of time that their heart was bigger than the analytics, right? It's the Rocky story. And so if you can measure somebody's heart and you understand how that heart, when applied, scales, well, wouldn't you want to know that in every single person within your organization, even if you're a party of two? And then the rest of it, the systems and all that, whatever, should align with the heartbeat of your people. But that type of thinking wasn't very popular when I started back in the 80s. You know, when I decided to build a school inside my company so that I would never ask a parent to commute to their children. I think the worst thing you can say to somebody is you need to make a choice between your child and making a living. What? How's that acceptable? Right? So I was like, okay, everybody bring their pets and bring their kids. And we set up this huge atrium in the middle of our company and we hired a bunch of homeschool teachers and we homeschooled from our offices. So there was never that choice. And when I did that, there was like, oh, well, that's because you're a female CEO. And I'm like, oh, how about that's because I care about my people? Like, what does that have to do with the heels, right? Yeah. I was like, nothing to do with me being a female. It just seemed logical to me was to sh close that gap for choices that I just don't think are, are right choices to ask somebody to make. I That's kind of that. how that all started. It was never this grand master plan. I'm like, I'm really not that smart. It was a matter of saying, this doesn't seem right to me. There's got to be a better way. How do I serve my people better? How can I make life better? better, right? I also don't believe you can go in two directions at the same time. People go, I do this for work and then I do this really because my life. And I'm like, really? How are you going work and life at the same time? Because you have 365 days, you have 24 hours in a day, and you have a life. And in that life, you happen to make money. But that's not what you do, right? It just, it's a byproduct. And so I just wanted to bring the people operating system into a very healthy manner. The great thing about the Genius Key is it's 100% agnostic. I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. I don't know if you're black, white, yellow, green. I don't know what your religion is. I don't know how old you are. I don't know whether you went to MIT, Wharton, or you were never schooled at all. I don't know where you are in the world. Until you click yes, I have no idea who you are. And that's the way it should be, because why do I care? Why would I care about the packaging? And when I started it, people were like, whoa. You can't give that much responsibility to people. And I'm like, but you just said people are the secret, se secret ingredient to success. But yet what, you don't trust your people, but you're asking them to trust you, right? You have to give before you can receive. And every time we take somebody through the genius key, they're like, oh my God, like why doesn't everything work this way? Because it's healthier. It's self-selected. It's self-driven. It's all those things. I'm really excited to do my decoding later. Yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> awesome. So I can't wait for the decoding later to see what I look like, what my genius is, yes. so to speak. So um, I know a problem that a lot of companies have is that their business leaders are not self-aware. Mm -hmm. So how can others improve their self-awareness? It's not so hard. You know, it's not, it's not leader. It's all people mm -hmm. are not self-aware, right? Because you're in the bubble. Right? So it would be trying to like doing your own brain surgery. Even if you had the capability, it's not possible. Right? So self-awareness is a reflection, right? And that's what makes it difficult. So the, the hardest task in human behavior is to look straight ahead and into a mirror and tell yourself your truth. Mm. Right? And so what happens is when you start to speak, if you don't believe it, you, you move eye contact. And so I watch, I film people saying, I like myself, right? And then they go, I like myself, sort of, like this, that thing. And so you cannot tell a lie and make eye contact. That's why when you take a look at behavior, one of the first things about somebody who's lying is they can't maintain eye contact. It's a quick look in a direction to tell you I'm lying, right? But it's harder when you look into the mirror. And so I bring people through these exercises so they can start to discover their own truth. The other thing about self-awareness is, 
and you'll like this now, <laughs> you cannot see in others what does not live within you. So if you see me and you go, oh, it's really the vibration within you. If you look at me and you go, wow, like I am, like I'm inspired. It's you. You are seeing you vibrating off of me. You actually don't see me at all. And so if you can understand that when you interact with somebody and they are like, you know, losing their stuff and you're like, wow, you must really be, what can I do to serve you? Because it looks like it's having a really tough time over there, right? That it has nothing to do with you, right? I tell this really interesting story. I think when I really started about self-awareness, um, I was, um, I was young. <laughs> I, uh, having women out on the road as a speaker was not normal. It was usually men. Um, I was asked to come speak in Las Vegas. Um, I was in my hooker heels and all that. To get up. <laughs> it was three o'clock in the morning. And I was entering the ele elevator banks in Vegas. I don't know if you guys are familiar, right? But they, there's huge elevator banks. And so I was, and I was like at the above the casino level, so I was like at meeting level, so it's like level seven, trying to go way up. And the, the doors open, right, so I'm on level, looking like a hooker, 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. Doors open, and inside of there was three black men. And so I went like this, woo. And they looked at me, and I looked at them, and the guy in the back said, what, because we're black? And I was like, oh, isn't this interesting? And so I walked in the elevator and I said, can I just, and there was a little guy, he had cute little ponytails, adorable, and he looked at me and I said, do you think I paused because you're black? And they were like, and I was like, did you think for a second that there's three men in this room and it's small and I've got to go to the 30 something floor and I look like a hooker? Do you think this has more to do with the fact that you're men, not the color of your skin? I would have done the same thing if it was through Asian dudes, white dudes, ever. And the little guy said to me, he goes, I never thought about that. And I was like, isn't it interesting? If I, if he didn't say something, I wouldn't have said something. And he wouldn't have learned. And I wouldn't have learned. And so I got off the elevator and I was like, he really thought that this was like a skin thing, not a instinctual woman thing that, you know, I've always been taught, don't get into small spaces with a lot of men, especially <laughs> at three o'clock in the morning. Just like if you are a man and you want to ask me to go to your hotel room and it's 3 a.m., yeah, I am not that girl. <laughs> I'm the girl who's going to meet you for breakfast, not come to you with your hotel room. And I was like, wow. And so like the next morning, I was like, man, I was like, hey, you know, I met these guys. <laughs> I'm like, you can imagine me, check it out. I met these three guys. One was kind of whatever, a cute little pun. And they're like, oh yeah, Snoop Dogg. I'm like, what? And so I wrote a letter to him and I said, you impacted my life. That was really Snoop Dogg. Really Snoop Dogg. Oh yeah. my God. Yeah. And I was like, you changed my trajectory because I never would have known what you saw. Right? I never, like, it be, like awareness came, like, whew. I was like, so I, from that moment on, I realized that when I'm with somebody who is a different packaging than I am, that they think it's the packaging that I'm seeing. So I have to enlighten them that no, it was a penis thing that I was seeing. It had nothing to do with the packaging. I was like, whoop, I'm outnumbered, but I'm not getting in there. Right. And so I, these conversations is what brings you into awareness, right? You know, same thing with Oprah. She wrote this, she was doing a, a book club about um, the, the blue eyed girl. And I was in that thing and they, she was talking about how, how much you know, she and people of color wanted to be the blonde hair, blue eyed, skinny, t t small, that girl. And I was like, so did I. <laughs> if I was a kinky hair, Italian, not dark, not light, but kind of medium, weird color. I wanted to be that girl. I said, it's not just, it's not a color thing. It's an everybody who isn't blonde hair, blue eyed thing. I wanted to be that girl, you know, and to have that little, you know, boy figure that goes, we, I mean, that wasn't who I was. And so when people start to have the conversations, even though they are not politically correct in the conversation, I'm learning, you're learning. And then I get an opportunity to say, teach me a better way. How do I approach something that I don't understand? Right. But I didn't have 
awareness to go into the elevator and go, hey, I'm really kind of nervous right here, so help me understand what would be the better reaction here because I actually would like to get out of the elevator. Like, it takes time. Yeah. But when you talk about awareness, I don't think anybody's aware. Nobody's really aware because it's easier to live in the story you choose to tell yourself. You want to tell the story that it's really not me, it's her, and it's that, whatever. We love those stories because it makes us feel better because then we, we, we are relinquished the responsibility. But if we're in awareness, that means you're willing to take responsibility of what you are doing to contribute to the outcome. So the answer should always be, what can I do differently so that this does not happen again? Or what can I do exactly with so I get it more of it? But that should be a continual situation in your life that as you're doing something and you're like, oh, I kind of like how this feels, you're like, okay, what am I doing that's attracting this? Mm -hmm. And then when you go, mm -hmm. what am I doing that I could be doing differently so I don't get that feeling from another person? You, know, you said two things there that I thought, number one, I want to tell you that if it's true that whatever you know I'm seeing in you is actually a reflection of me, I'm fabulous. Okay? <laughs> I am fabulous. But we all said to begin with, we think you are fabulous. No, but I mean, I really yeah. didn't. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, I, but but it, that's what I see in you. I see this, you know, brave, men, outspoken woman that, you know, is not afraid to, you know, throw some things out there and yeah. that kind of stuff. So I see I'm that. not brave at all. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I, I'm, I'm riddled full of insecurities. I'm, I'm painfully shy. I am a hermit. I, I literally would never leave my house. Y'all believe her? Would never leave my house, <laughs> right? It, it, you see you. You're not seeing me. Interesting. Right? Because this me would literally never put on makeup. I would put on heels, though. I just I would walk around in heels. That I would do because I just think they're so much fun. But I'm not that girl. I'm, I'm an I'm a I'm a introvert. I'm an INTJ. I'm an introvert person. I'm scared. I'm like your opposite. Right. I'm an right. INFP. Right. I'm scared. I think you're going to judge me. I think you're going to be like, oh, Amelia, how did you lose? Why did you lose all, all the gain, all that weight during? Like, I feel all that stuff goes in my head. So I've got to go bad shadow, bad shadow, bad shadow. Oh, I shadow. like that. Yeah. yeah. And, and to, to program myself. But when people say to me, which I was, you know, people go, well, you're brave and you're confident. I'm like, well, nope, I'm actually insecure. I don't want to be vulnerable. All those other, and that's why I'm a big Brene, Fran, uh, Brene Brown fan as well. Because she is very honest with how uncomfortable it is to be on stage. And it is very uncomfortable to be the person and all of you out there. And then there's just us up here. And I'm going, do they notice the zit that I got going on? And, you know, <laughs> because we have to wear masks my, right my, now. You know, yeah, I mean, <laughs> all these things is what, rattles around in there yeah. and then you get to a point where you practice enough to say I'm going to ask for forgiveness before we even start because I'm going to do something that's going to disappoint you I'm going to say something that's not politically correct I'm going to in my 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 trying to learn I'm going to make mistakes so if you're okay that I'm going to make mistakes then I'm okay with being here and that was part of why I was so excited to meet you because I was like I, I was like She's really okay if maybe I'm not what she thought I would be. What if I let you down? What if I whatever? And you have to have this constant relationship of adult commitment to say, I'm doing the best I can over here, but I'm, I'm only human and I'm still learning. And so I'll forgive you if you can forgive me and now we can have an honest relationship because I already know it's not over. Right? I'm not going to do something. You go, oh, it's over. <laughs> it's over now. No longer friends. But your brain says that. Yeah. You're like, oh, that's it. You know, I lost my job. They're not going to be friends with me anymore. He, I'm getting divorced. I mean, we go to such extremes in our head. You know, and as women, we're really good at going to extremes. I mean, the story I can create in my head in literally five minutes that, you know, like Michael come home and he'll be like, okay, what is going on in your head now? I'm like, let me just tell you the story that I painted. He's like, and what I was really doing was I was down the block talking to Joe. And I was like, okay, well, see you. Yeah, right. we call that writing scripts. And we waste <laughs> yeah, so yes. much time yeah. worrying about yeah. stuff that doesn't even yeah. exist. Yeah, so. but it's fun. It's yeah. great if you just make it a novel. <laughs> you know, you can sell it, you know, create an Instagram story out of it. Because we're very creative. <laughs> and so as long as you know that that's really what's going on, right? And so I try to teach our kids that never discount. Something is always happening. It's never what you think is happening, but something is always happening. And so when you're confronted with what I call chaos energy, 
you're going to go, wow, I wonder what's going on over there. Hmm. Doesn't look, doesn't look like it's really good. So when somebody cuts you off or somebody's like, I got to be first in this line, I'm like, far more important to you than it is to me. So please go right. Let me celebrate you in that. Right? Because something's going on mm -hmm. with them and it has nothing to do with me. And all I wanted to do is not stick to me. So I'm like, if you really need to be your shopping cart in front of my shopping cart, go right ahead. Are you familiar with Michael Singer? Oh, yes. That's yes. what that just reminded me of. Yes. So, yes. Uh, the Untethered Soul is a fantastic, but it talks about those energy blocks and how you, um, exactly that. If somebody breaks in front of you, you know, don't get mad. Just understand that their energy is in a different place. Yeah. And just let it go so that you don't get clogged up. Yeah. And when you find out, again, the awareness, when you mm -hmm. find out the story of what's really happening, I trust you. I, you are going to be like, so glad that that's not happening to me, right? Because you have to realize that. We are wired as humans to bond, right? That's why we're A, not one of us, and why we all look so different. We're meant to, we're community animals, right? We're here to bond and to connect. If I put any one person alone on an island, we'd die. We would die because we're social creatures. And why we make it so difficult on ourselves is beyond me. You should wake up every day curious. You know, like I look, I go, oh, I want to know what your story is. I want to know what yours, what are you doing? You know, what did you have for dinner? I'm like, I'm curious about everything. And if you approach curiosity with an open and non-judgment, then those opportunities of, hey, I think I can take this and add this over here and create something better. But what you're creating is better is we, not I. I have done nothing. My team, my people, the collective have done great things. But any great leader, you know, take Elon Musk, Oprah Winfrey, you know, any of them, if you take their people away, they wouldn't have executed anything, right? Because it's a part of an ingredient of a big recipe. And every team is a recipe that is trying to deliver brilliance or genius. Well, you talk about the reward language. Yes. Can you, and, and how that applies in a business. So tell us a little bit more about what that looks like and why it helps us be more productive. So somewhere along the way, businesses came to the conclusion, clearly they did not ask me, <laughs> that to reward people, we're going to give you a raise or a bonus. But financially, I'm going to reward you because that is the reward language that people speak. Although statistics show you that if you give a person, they win the lottery, they come into a lot of money, that within two and a half years, they go back to their baseline. So even if you do millions of dollars, in literally two and a half years, you're going to go back to exactly where you are right now. And so it proves that money is not people's reward. Right? And so when I take about, talk about reward, I'm talking about what fills your bucket. Like we've all had that friend that you go, oh, God, it's her on the phone. <laughs> like I really don't want to take this call. Because they, they literally just suck the energy. Right? You go into in the room and you're like, oh, I know what that one is. Right? You know already that they're just going to suck the energy. And then there's other people that you go, oh, my gosh, like I feel so great around this person. So I was like, well, what is it that fills somebody's bucket up from the inside. And that's what I call their reward language, right? So there's something that makes you feel good. And what you have to put that through, and that's part of the keys, is to say, is what you are consuming, right, that's filling you up, does it work for you? Because a lot of people feed on chaos because it makes them feel important. Some people feed on negative language and ne negative talk because they have worthiness issues, right? And so if you go through the process and you realize that what truly fills you up is healthy, then if I can give it to you, that means every time we interact, I'm amplifying you from the inside. But what I've learned is that you can't, your food doesn't work for me and my food doesn't work for you. And in a company environment, when you try to do a one size fits all, mm -hmm. then that means nobody's actually happy. And even the person that you reward with money, they're going to go back to their baseline or they wouldn't work for you to begin with. That's why they're there, right? And so the systems for the genius key allows people to set 
their reward? Is it time? Is it freedom? Is it, you know, wealth things that, right? What is it? And then from there, it reverse engineers and tells you if that is what that feeds you, then this is what you have to do every day to get to that goal. And it drops it down to your calendar. So the only way you can't get to success is you physically have to go into your calendar and turn it off. Nope, I don't want it. If you follow, there's no way to not hit the milestone. It's impossible because small actions every day lead you to big goals. And so that's what the keys are doing. It's helping you understand yourself and then taking those keys and saying, this is what I want. And then it's going, so what you're saying is you want to trade X for Y. And you're like, yes, that's what I want. And then when you accept, it drops it down to your calendar. And I think, so two questions. What is your reward language? So for, for me, it's small acts of kindness, right? That's what really makes me feel like you love me, right? Is if you know, like, so perfectly, I'm coming to this. I was in a, a capital raise meeting before this because that was fun. <laughs> um, and so one of my um, big favorite people brought me my flip-flops because they knew I'd be running up and down and up and down, back and forth in the building that we were in and knew I was going to be here. And they're like, Amelia, let me bring you your flip-flops and I know I'll bring you your heels too. So it was an act of kindness. Did I need you to bring? No, but it made me feel like you cared about me. It made me feel like I'm a coffee. I love coffee. I love the way it's, I should call it my boyfriend. I love the way it smells. <laughs> I, like it, I like the way it feels. I'm like, oh, my boyfriend. I, <laughs> you smell so good. You know, I'm like, I, it makes me happy afterward. Like I have like this intimate relationship with coffee. And so when somebody on my team is like, oh, it's about, you know, and brings me a cup of coffee, not ask for, like if I have to ask, then doesn't, right? I feel like, you get me. You so get me. You think you so much, right? So those are the things that fill my bucket. And so I have something which is called a day board, right? So this is a fun exercise, right? So if you ask somebody, what's your perfect day? Most people have no clue what that is. I can't give you something if you don't know what it is. Most people go, some sleep would be great. I'm like, okay, no, but really, a perfect day. From the moment you open up your eyes, what would happen next? And then what would happen? And then what would happen? And then what would happen? all the way through the entire day. I can show you my perfect day. Hmm. Well, if I can show you, ah, you can give it to me. <laughs> it's really that simple. And so I go through my office and I pick something off people's day board and I give it to them. Ah, every day. That's great. I go through, and so like for me, it's coffee. For one of my other people, they're a big uh, candle, whatever. Other per people are saving money right now because they want to send one of their kids to college, right? So I'll go through and put a little bit of money in an envelope, but just little things, little acts of kindness that mean something to you. And it has huge reward. So I'm like, why would anybody invest in a business that did not show you a plan on how they're investing in their people? Because I will tell you that if you try to take one of my people away, good luck to you. <laughs> because I am committed to serve them with everything I have, everything that I know, to make their life, not good, amazing. That's my job as the CEO. And so every investor, every CEO, their job is what is your people operating system? You guys know, right? How much does it cost if somebody leaves an organization to retrain them, whatever, to bring somebody on and onboard them? How much am I going to have to invest in that individual? right? That's real money. So why does every company not have a people operating? How do you onboard them? How do you develop them? How are you going to retain it? Where's that plan? Because that plan directly relates to the success. That's, those are the things that I talk about going, that's the most important questions ever. You want my marketing plan? Who gives a hoot about my marketing plan? If my people plan sucks, then people leave. Thank you for watching episode one of this two-part series with Amelia Antonetti. Join us next week for the rest of the conversation and a Q&A with our studio audience.